Hi, I'm Sean Carroll, and welcome to the inaugural episode of Preposterous Universe. We've decided to start things off with a bang with one of the most important topics in all of science, the brain, what Woody Allen once called his second favorite organ, but one that we do not yet understand. We are learning a lot as scientists about how the brain works, what it is, and what it's going to be useful for once we're better at it better at hooking up the brain to the external world, at figuring out what is going on inside and taking advantage of what we're learning. So we have a great panel today. We have as our guest Philip Lowe, who is uh, the founder, CEO, and president of a company called NeuroVigil and a computational neuroscientist. And on our distinguished panel of question askers and provocateurs, <laughs> we have Crystal Dilworth, who is a PhD student in neuroscience at Caltech. And we have Ricardo Gil da Costa, who is a uh, cognitive neuroscientist at the Salk Institute and co-founder of a company called Neuroverse. Because even neuroscientists are jealous of cosmologists. They want to get the universe in there somehow. We we'll just think we're that big at least. You think that as big yes. as the universe. So Philip, tell me, I, I hear that the government uh, wants to get into the brain game in a big way. They've, uh, the Obama administration has announced some brain activity mapping project modeled in some sense on the human genome project. They're going to go in there and look at what of all, all of our neurons are doing. Is that right? That's right. That's absolutely right, Sean. A number of neuroscientists have been summoned to the White House every once in a while to discuss uh, how uh, we might be able to create a, a project on the scale of the human genome project that would really advance neuroscience in a massive way. And it's not like they're going to build a giant building with an institute with a big brain in it. They're going to, this is giving money to researchers all over the place to study the brain in different ways? This is about creating over a 10 year period the most comprehensive representation of the brain in order to really start looking at, uh, at the brain in a, in a holistic way. Do they actually use the word holistic? Do scientists use that word? Physicists would never use that word. That's well, the, you know, if you study the universe, there's no point to say holistic, right? Uh, but when we look at the brain, uh, it's important to sort of uh, ha have an idea of uh, how particular uh, pieces are going to fit together. So perhaps let's just leave it at comprehensive if you're more comfortable with that. <laughs> so uh, Crystal, what do you think? Does this sound useful? Is this going to impact your kind of work at all? Um, it will definitely impact the work that my lab does if we are able to benefit wow. from the grants. Um, this is exactly the type of work that we do. How do individual cells talk to each other? How do individual cells in different areas of the brain talk to each other? How do those areas talk to, you know, whole networks? And um, yeah, so it's really, it's really exciting. We're trying to improve brain-computer right. interfaces, right? Let's look at, let, 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 let's flip everything. Uh, on its head, no pun intended, and, and, and look at <laughs> broad signals that are coming from the brain. You're cruel, you neuroscientists. Very cruel. Cool. So <laughs> in terms of BCI, I'm interested in BCI giving brain-computer brain computer interface. interface. A big fear in ALS is when individuals are so paralyzed, they become quote-unquote locked in, and they lose the ability to communicate. I'm interested in giving them a platform so that they can communicate with the world uh, in a dignified way while they have neuropathology. So the work we're doing with Stephen Hawking, for Stephen example. Stephen Hawking is an obvious example, yeah. Right. We have created for him a, a te an entire technology platform that really enables him and other patients with ALS to actually control a cursor on a screen just using your mind so that you can actually pick letters and words and still communicate. When we did this experiment with Stephen the first time, we, we asked him to imagine that he could move his hand, for example, exactly. right? And we were able to see that even though he couldn't move his hand, we had a signal that we were reading from his brain. Right. And now we have found a way to, um, to tie the signal to an output. You're not actually having something on a blank screen where I'm thinking a word and the word appears word. there. What I do have is a sequence of letters in there. And what you're doing is allowing to control to pick which one of these letters. And it's, what is, what it's, is there's multiple here? sides of BCI, right? And, and Philip is, is alluding to one of them, which is motor control, right? Motor so you control. can have many different ways and levels of neural prosthetics that can allow you exactly to do that, right? To recover some kind of motor control or a communication skill that you lost. Another aspect of it will be reading the brain, for instance, right? Reading you want to infer right. yeah. what someone is thinking or, you know, what kind of knowledge do they have or, so that's another aspect to it. We're not to reading thoughts things. directly. Right. right. But we're but reading There was an article a few years ago in The Onion, Stephen right. Hawking develops robotic exoskeleton. <laughs> so he looked like Iron Man in this fake picture from The Onion. So I think that's what the person on the street wants to know. How long will it be until 
uh, not just people like Stephen Hawking, but our artificial limbs um, for amputees and things yeah, like yeah, that they're, will just they're become a reality. extensions of ourselves. Yeah. More and how more. natural will that so be? Now you've got you know the army, for example, that has um, with DARPA that is a, that has come up with this project, and you can see people who, who are moving limbs that are completely artificial. Mm -hmm. What we're doing, um, you know, in my lab is to actually use a single sensor, completely non-invasively, and figure out if a person wanted to move. His left hand, his right hand, his left foot, his so right foot. So non-invasively means you're wearing a hat you or something well, like that. It, it's going to be a patch. It's going to be patch. something very, very small. What it sounds like to me, correct me again if I'm wrong, but someday I won't need to punch in buttons or talk to Siri. I will just think to myself, text Crystal and the iPhone will do it. And I think the motor parts of the motor output, let's put it this way, being moving a course around the screen, being, you know, facilitating the exoskeleton and walking, it's one thing. The big loop from that is when you go from that specific output to now I want to read your thoughts. I'm right. going to start with a blank slate and I want to know what you're thinking. And that's a very different ballgame. Okay. So the final closing question, as scientists, we all travel around a lot. I literally was in Australia 24 hours ago and flew here. And I, it's a bother to do all this traveling. So I would like to be a brain in a vat that controls external bodies that give talks all around the world. How many years before I can do that? The difficult sounding thing from what Ricardo was saying is that you're not going to just hook up to Stephen Hawking's brain and hear him say, calculate the path integral over Euclidean manifolds with the common boundary. Not yet. But maybe someday. All right, Crystal, brain in a vat, feasible or no? Um, I'm not convinced, but I haven't done the breadth of research that these two have, I wouldn't want to be a brain in a vat, personally. Have you tried? Have you been the brain I in a vat? I have not, but I think I'm good. <laughs> how much, seriously, how much, uh, you know, we are, it's, a, it's a whole area of ickiness, right? Of stuff that seems disconcerting to us. And we didn't even talk about reading people's minds in ways right. they don't want us to read. How much do you guys, as in your professional capacity, worry about these crazy sounding future science fiction stuff that might be here in 50 years that we need to start worrying about? Well, for me, I'm a graduate student, so I worry about what's going to help me graduate with my PhD. That's perfectly true. <laughs> right. uh, I think, you know, it's not going to be in 50 years. I think a part of it, we're doing it already. You know, as Philip was saying, we do a lot of the brain. So it's not 50, quotes. it's sooner than 50. Yes, it's ongoing to some extent, and it's going to be, you know, I would expect that with the next five years, you're going to see very radical advances in multiple yeah. fields. Whatever. And telepathy? That's a whole new ballgame. You need a new show for that, Sean. You need a new show. We'll All talk right. about well, that new I think show. we should uh, think, keep that in mind. We have an excellent show. This was a fantastic pilot. Thank you very much thank you. for joining me here today. And uh, thank you guys out there in Internet land for joining. And I hope you come back for another episode of Preposterous Universe.